All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Tahoe Beach Retreat Lodge and Conference Center. And thanks to those of you who came out tonight. I know we're living in extra interesting times. So I want to welcome all of you here, and I also want to welcome all the folks that are joining us on the live stream. My name is Steve Deshera, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Lake Tahoe South Shore Chamber of Commerce, also known as Tahoe Chamber. And with me tonight are uh, my colleagues, Annie Hendrick, Emily Abernathy, Zach Fiore, our chamber team. We have a couple of board members here this evening, Bob Anderson, Tiffany Zabaglo. Am I missing someone? We probably have some board members out in the live stream audience as well. So a lot of times people say, well, what does the chamber do? And I will talk a little bit about that tonight. But one of the things we do is we convene. We convene people together to solve problems. We convene people together to learn important information about our community. So we're particularly pleased tonight to have a great panel here. It's not very often anymore, even ever maybe, that we get to hear from all three of our local governments, City of South Lake Tahoe, El Dorado County, Douglas County, and of course TRPA, our regional government, uh, in one place. A lot of times you can go to one of their meetings, or you can read about something they're doing, but not very often anymore do we get to hear from all four of these entities at one point in time. And that's our purpose here tonight, so they can each share with you what the hot issues and hot topics are in their area. We'll see if there's some synergy, I hope so. Um, and then after each of them presents, uh, we'll have a chance for your questions to ask them uh, some things that may be on your mind uh, today as we as we gather here, both on the live stream and in person. So back to the issue of what does the chamber do? So we convene, we're also a catalyst, and we're also a champion for causes. And some of you who have followed us along over the years, and thanks to many of you in the room and on the live stream who are members of the chamber, because we couldn't do what we do without our members, without the support of our membership. Um, but we look at what we think the community should be like based on input from lots of folks and we advocate for that. So it's not just a question of important events that we do, important networking opportunities that we do, but it's what do we want, what do we collectively want our community to be and then we go about the hard work of trying to make that happen. And that's not easy. And every once in a while when we think we might be on a roll, something happens like a virus that we have to deal with. And right now we're in the trenches trying to work to make sure that our local business community is not harmed any more than we all will be by what's going on right now. It's tough times. I was flying back from Washington, D.C. last night, and I was looking at the people that are flying the plane and serving those of us on the plane. And the people at the airports, you know, working, cleaning the airports, working at the restaurants, working at the shops. You know, we're all in peril to some degree right now. And so it really demands the attention of all of us, and it's certainly as the chamber, we are on the front lines working for all of you every day. So we had a Vision 2020 document, and we were pretty proud of that, it was pretty good, um, but we sat down and we looked at it, we looked at it as a board of directors and a staff last fall, said we could do better, and we need to do better for our community. We need to have a vision that is measurable, so when we get down the line to a certain year, we can say, how did we do? Did we have some successes? Did we have some things we could have done better? What is the next iteration of our vision for the South Shore of Lake Tahoe? So out of our retreat with our board and staff last fall, we decided to update our vision to a vision 2025. So this is Tahoe 2025. It's on the seat here, and it's available, I'm sure, on our website soon. A South Shore community vision. And this is not just the vision that we made up sitting in a room. Hey, that'd be nice. Oh, that'd be good. Oh, let's do that. We actually reached out to the people that are experts in our community in different areas. Uh, the local economy, health and wellness, recreation, housing, infrastructure, transportation, uh, arts, culture, entertainment, leadership. How do we get all these things done? So out of that, our board reached out, talked to people, we synthesized a lot of input, and we came up with this particular document, and we're proud to unveil it tonight. We'd be interested in your feedback. Uh, not necessarily tonight, probably take you a while to go through it, but uh, it does lay out a vision 
that again is not just our vision as the chamber, but it's a community vision. And the commitment we're making to you and to all of us is to go out and advocate for that vision. So um, we recently went to our annual gathering of chambers. It's called the Western Association of Chamber Executives. And they just emphasized how important. And these are chambers from all around the Western United States and Western Canada. And there's no, no two of them alike. They have a saying, you've seen one chamber, you've seen one chamber. Because we're all different, but we have many things in common. We advocate for our community. We are a catalyst, which means like we're a spark. We're the energy of a community. And we are a convener, pulling people together to solve problems. And we're a champion. Once we know what we're after, we're a champion for that. And we're relentless in our pursuit. So I encourage you to uh, look at the document when you get a chance. Again, we appreciate your feedback. Uh, some of the things that are in there that I think are probably work worth mentioning, and I, I talked about this just a little bit, but you know, I've been around here long enough to have been to some meetings where the city and Douglas County Commission got together, the city council and the county commission. I was even at a meeting not too many years ago where the two counties and the city got together. So it was a meeting of the Elder Bottle County Board of Supervisors, Douglas County Commission, City of South Lake Tahoe City Council. And they talked about some common issues. And so one of the things that we see in the future is that that would happen on a more frequent basis. Because it's hard to solve a problem when you're in a multi-jurisdictional melting pot like Lake Tahoe with two states, all these local governments, regional agencies, but yet that's, that's part of the challenge. It's, it's part of the beauty of, of living here and doing business here, but it's part of the challenge. So the more that these governmental entities can interact and work together and talk about mutual problems and solutions, the better. It talks about housing and talking about a specific goal that's coming out of the new housing action plan here on the South Shore for 150 new housing units that are affordable for our workforce and those of us who live here. So there's some real, real uh, meat in here. And again, we want to hear what you have to say about it. So if you're not already a chamber member, join up. Be part of the effort that we have working for the entire South Shore to get to being a better place. We're good. We could be better. We've got some challenges. It's going to take all our energy to solve those challenges and move forward and pass this wonderful place on to the coming generations. So with that, again, I want to introduce uh, Mayor Jason Collin from the city of South Lake Tahoe and also his colleagues here, Don Ashton. Don is the chief administrative officer of El Dorado County. He is here tonight uh, because the supervisors are running around on the road. So Don was kind enough to come up and join us. And then uh, Commissioner Larry Walsh from Douglas County, current vice chair of the county commission. And of course, Joanne Marquetta, the executive director of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. So we're going to get a little sense of how they see the state of the South Shore community from their perspective. And then we'll have your questions and answers. So, Mayor Collin. Thank you, Mr. Teixeira. So this is on, right, Brandy? OK. Good evening. And thanks for, to everybody for making it out. And thanks to everybody for being on the live stream. Uh, as you know, this is, is kind of a crazy time. We've got two big storms approaching. One of them we're really excited about because we finally have some snow coming in this weekend. So that's exciting. And the other one, we don't really know what to expect. Uh, so when we were pr putting these slides together in the last week or so, things have changed quite a bit. So I'm sure there's a lot of questions. There's a lot more speculation, a lot more unknowns because we don't know how this is going to impact us from a, a health and quality of life standpoint, and also the economic impact for our community. Uh, so there's a, it's, it's kind of a scary time, but we are all working together, and uh, there's been a lot of communication, and w we are going to get through this. We're a strong community, and we'll be even stronger when we get through this together. So I'm sure a lot of that stuff will come up in the questions, but right now we're just going to talk about the, the state of the city, and We've been going through a lot of transitions as well. As you know, we had a city manager leave, and then uh, we just hired a city manager. And in fact, I just had to check to see if the press release went out so I could say his name. So we're very excited to have Joe Irvin on board. It came out five hours ago. I've been going since 3.40 this morning, and I hadn't even been on my email. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that's exciting. He's, he's actually from, Ta well, he lived in Tahoe. He went to LTCC. So we have a local kid coming back and he and his wife met up here. They're super excited to be coming back to Tahoe and I think it'll be really, really great for the city. So that uh, has been taking up 
quite a bit of our time was doing that search and finding the right candidate, and we absolutely were, were certain he's the right guy, and we're really excited to have him on board. We just went through our strategic planning uh, cycle or um, exercise just a couple weeks ago. So what I have for you tonight is based a lot on what we did in 2019 when we had our previous city manager, Frank Rush, was there, and we had a new council, and we came up with a lot of things. Um, so we'll go through a lot of those because we, we've done a lot of really good things in this last year. We've built a lot of momentum, and now it's about keeping that momentum and really getting focused and, and doing maybe fewer, a few, few things great instead of a lot of things okay or good. Okay? There's so many priorities, there's so many things we want to do, but we really want to get focused and do some things really, really well. So you, this we came up with a few years ago that as our, our motto that we will reflect the national treasure in which we live. We talked about this at our strategic planning event and still embrace this. We don't want to have it as a motto. It'll probably be moving into more of like our vision in the future. And the reason the thought behind this was that, that this is something that everybody in the basin could get behind, whether you're a government entity, whether you're a business, whether it's a, a private party, uh, you know, the Forest Service, that hopefully everybody could buy into this, that we all want to reflect this amazing place that probably should have been a national park. Okay? I mean, it truly is a national treasure, and we want to do everything we can to preserve it and promote it as such. Now, again, these are my, we had a lot of information from last year so we are working on distilling it down with everything that's been going on. The staff has not put it all together because they have competing priorities, and then this was just a lot of information. So these are my kind of distillations of what we have. So don't hold anybody accountable to these exact words, please. Uh, but it will be something probably similar to this when they finally come out. So the vision now is going to be, uh, we're simplifying it, that we will be the world leader in creating a vibrant, inclusive, caring community which focuses on quality of life, economic prosperity, and environmental stewardship. And our mission that we will promote the prosperity of our city through responsible governance, policy, action, and reverence for this place we call home. So if you were involved in them last year, they were a lot longer, a lot harder. So we're just trying to get really to those, those real gold, the gold in there, what's really important. Our values that were aligned, inclusive, innovative, service-driven, forward-thinking, fiscally responsible, and stewards of our environment. So in 2019, we had a lot of priorities. So we had these 13, plus we had, underneath them, we had a lot of things. And this, the city staff did an amazing job at getting a lot of stuff done. They did an incredible job, and we're pulled in many, many different directions because we had so many priorities. But we got a lot done, so we're just going to talk about some of those things. In public safety, we got 17 new police vehicles, created two new police officer positions. With the help of the SAFER grant, we are opening fire station number two with seven new firefighters. And we've got, we initiated improvements in the communication system. So that's a huge thing because that's been, and it, that's a big, big project, but we're going to keep working on that. But initiating that was a really big step. In public works, we increased street re rehab efforts and ramped up stormwater mitigation projects. And as most of you, hopefully most of you have driven down the amazing Sierra Boulevard Complete Street Project, and that had huge environmental gains as well. And we also got some new snow removal equipment. In development services, we developed or we established a workforce housing fund and creation of a new housing manager position. So Patrick Conway is back, and we are very excited to have him. If anybody it was at the city council meeting or watched it, we had a presentation on some of the housing initiatives, and he's going to be he'll have a key role in that with our partnership with our Prosperity Center and other partners around the basin. And then we've earmarked additional funding for transit and housing projects, and we are taking an active role in the US 50 South Shore Community Revitalization Project and Main Street Management Plan. So that was a big shift before the city didn't have a real active role, and now we are definitely participating. And then successfully and effectively implemented a cannabis ordinance and development agreements. That was such a huge topic. And then once we got it done, it's just like it's just smooth now. So I just say, like, once we said OK to cannabis, everybody just chilled out. That's kind of weird. <laughs> 
All right, so finance, uh, we went through, our finance department went through organizational review and restructure to decrease cost. And we have cash reserves right now of $18.1 million. So right now we're in a good cash position. And if, oh, yeah, we go. the next one, recreation. We continue to improve mobility with extension and creation of bike paths. A lot of co uh, collaboration and coordination with the county on that. And we also have the ability to keep them clear in the winter, which is huge. And then, not that we've needed to use it this year, but uh, hopefully after this weekend we will. And then we're, the coffer of the, our major P funds continues to grow. So that's the only good thing about ha the, the delay that occurred with getting the new rec center going is that we are building up those funds. And now we are actively pursuing that and creating a partnership and vision with the county on making the 56 acre project a reflection of this national treasure in which we live. And that's a super, super exciting project. The other thing that's, that's not on here is uh, a lot of our environmental stewardship. We, last year, one of the priorities was to address climate change. But this year, we, as you'll see, we expanded that into more environmental stewardship. And with our 100% renewable initiative that the city has adopted, that we made some really big gains on that this year with, at the airport. We had put 200, I think it's 294 solar panels on the airport. And that whole facility with that and improvements in the electricity with LED lighting, it is completely uh, off the grid now. So it's 100% renewable at the airport. So that's a really big step. We've got our Civic Spark fellows. We're doing a lot of really great stuff to be great stewards of our environment and really start addressing the issues that are, are posed with climate change. So the hot topics for 2020 and beyond, uh, the biggest one is it's always going to be finances. So money, where's our money coming from? Where's our money coming from? And um, with five-year projections, we were, we were seeing some negative cash flows. And with, with Measure T, we don't know if, that, if, if it does go into effect. There's definitely going to be uh, some shortfall in our TOT with that. Uh, oops, sorry, that's the last one. That's about 1.5 million is what's projected from the TOT on that. Uh, this year, the first quarter TOT and sales tax were both down. So together, over $300,000. And um, then CalPERS continues to be a concern. So those are the, some of the, the things. And then obviously now with what's going on with the coronavirus, we don't know what kind of financial impacts that will have on the city. The good news, though, is we have general fund reserve uh, at 18.1 million, so that's 38 percent of the budget, and 6.8 million dollars above what our mandated reserve is of 25 percent. We have two million dollars that's already earmarked for roads this year, so that's exciting because we've been trying to get just dedicated money to improve our roads. And I believe in April there's a presentation at our city council meeting about the next phases in that road improvement project. And then our property taxes for the first installment of uh, this year are $51,000 up from last year. And uh, just a note here that the city's five-year budget forecast and mid-year budget report will be presented during that April meeting as well. So our strategic pillars this year, so we're just, again, I, we're kind of compressing it down. So I, I think we're actually, there's a seventh one. So this is... Uh, again, it'll, be, it'll come out officially soon, but we're going economic development, high-performing government, public safety, quality of life and recreation, and in that quality of life is our, our housing initiatives, and then infrastructure and transportation and environment. And I, if I recall correctly, I think we actually separated transportation out because we know that transportation in our community is a top, top priority. All right, that's it for me. Do I get to hand it off to Don? All right. Oh, there you go, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So Don Ashton, again, is the administrative officer of El Dorado County. That means he's the, the lead executive working directly with the Board of Supervisors and with his staff. Don, welcome. Thank you, Steve, and thank you all for having me today, this evening. I don't have a PowerPoint. I apologize. Let me just go uh, off, of, off of some notes. It's really, this is fun for me, getting to hear what cities are doing and what other jurisdictions are doing because at the end of the day we all have very similar problems and you're going to hear some repeated themes um, between the county the county and the city the the state of the county right now I, I think that we can assure you the county is in the best shape it's been in probably the last 10 years 
Um, we've had stable leadership amongst the department head leadership team, stab stability on the Board of Supervisors, and, and that has shown through the efforts of our strategic planning process. We updated it last year. Um, we, I'm scheduled to give an update to the Board of Supervisors next month on the progress we've made in that regard. Um, and a lot of success has been done. The, some of the big accomplishments we've made, and a lot of this is on the West Slope and that, or down, down the hill from here, and that's just the reality of county government. You know, when it's in the regions we have, I have four board members that vote down there, and you have not even a full one that votes up here uh, because Supervisor Nova Cell goes down into Pollock Pines and things like that. So the, some of the big accomplishments we've had for the past four years, the primary focus has been on investing in our infrastructure. When I became the CAO four, almost four years ago now, most of our buildings were out of compliance with the ADA. They were at, had reached end of life, and basically we were told we need to tear them down and, and build again. We made a lot of progress in that regard. The sheriff's office has a new public safety facility. We, he used to be spread over 10 different buildings across the county. He's now in one complex. It was a $60 million project, the largest capital project the county has ever done. And it was completed in December, and it was completed on time and under budget. You don't hear that in the public sector very often. And that was accomplished. So that, that's, that's a really big deal. Up here in South Lake Tahoe, we call it the El Dorado Center. It's where we have our health and human services programs. It, that building is at end of life and falling down. And we, over the past five years, we set aside money to replace that. The county re recently purchased the, the Sandy Way building right behind it. Staff are in there, and you will likely see construction on the El Dorado Center starting, hopefully starting this, this summer. Um, and finishing next summer is, is the plan that might get pushed a year because of the construction season and things like that. So, so that's good news as well. From a fiscal outlook standpoint, when I became the CAO four years ago, the board had about 8% of our general fund operating budget in reserves. Um, now we have close to 25%. In reserves so and I will tell you counties almost always have fewer amounts in reserves in cities that's just kind of the way it works um, but the fact that we have close to 25 percent our general fund operating reserves up from eight percent four years ago that's a really significant progress and you you owe that commitment to to your board of supervisors um, to be able to soften a recession that comes in regards to our sales tax and property tax our sales tax is actually up about four percent this year. Um, they, we're not real sure why, to be honest, though. Um, and the reason is, is because a, few, a couple of years ago, the state had what was called the Board of Equalization. They were making a lot of mistakes into how sales tax was being distributed. So the state then disbanded that department and created a new one. And now we're seeing higher amounts of sales tax coming in. And part of that is due to corrections that were made from before. So we're really trying to figure out what is the true sales tax growth versus corrections from past, past mistakes. But for now, it's up about 4%. We usually project a 2% growth, so, so that's good. Um, our TOT is, is the single fastest growing revenue source for us. I think a lot of that is because of Measure T that was passed in the city. We're starting to see some more vacation home rentals in the county and incorporated areas. Pros and cons to that for sure, but our TOT is now up over $5 million. That was uh, last year, it ended at 5.3. It's almost doubled in the past three years. Um, so, but that's a scary revenue source for me to rely on because it's so dependent on the tourism. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about coronavirus now, but if questions come up, I'm prepared to answer that, but that's something that we're very concerned that's going to impact the tourism economy everywhere. So we'll, we'll see what happens. The scariest part of our funding streams is our property tax. Um, our El Dorado County is a property tax driven county. About 70 million of our general fund re revenues come from property tax. When I talk about sales tax, it's about 13 to 14. And I said TOT is about five. Our property tax, we, up until this year, we projected 5% growth. Last year it came in at four, about 4% 4 growth. Um, this year we projected 4%, it's coming in probably in the three to three and a half percent. That's, that's our projection. Every percent decline that uh, property tax declines, it's about $800, $700,000 to $800,000 in a loss of revenue. So why is it declining? What's going on? Well, 
there's, I think there's, there's a lot of things going on. The biggest thing is we're really concerned about the fire insurance and that the impact that's having, the, the inability of people to get fire insurance and the impact that's having on the market. So if property tax goes down, that's the biggest thing that causes recessions in the county. That's really what drove the, the, the county, the budget crisis and the recession in 2008, 9, and 10, right, was the housing bubble burst. The bottom fell out of the market. Well, it, it, that could potentially happen with the fire insurance. So that's, that's, we're watching that really closely. And so, so those, are the, that's a, that, those are the revenue projections. So um, right now we're, we're not too worried. We're not panicking about it for this next budget cycle. But if that trend continues, it's going to present a problem in future years. How about on the expense side? Well, the CalPERS, the pension, is, a, is the single largest threat to county budgets. Quite frankly, I think it's the single largest threat to local government budgets. It is increasing faster than, than our revenues can keep up. And at the end of the day, there's really nothing your county or your city can do to stop it. It's, it's decisions driven by the state of California and investment decisions they have chosen to make. I tend to blame a lot of that on the politics of California, when you have politicians telling an investment manager what they aren't allowed to invest in, for example, um, um, oil or guns or things like that, that are very popular in our country, whether we like it or not, and but that impacts the investment por investment por portfolio and the investments just aren't coming in where they're supposed to come in. So when CalPERS is estimating a 7% rate of return and it only comes in at 6%, that increases our costs. And that's what's been happening for several years. Many people always ask, well, why don't you change the pension amounts given to your employees? Well, one, that would be unfair because our employees have worked for a long time to have that pension system. Two, it's illegal, you can't. You can change it for new employees and most jurisdictions have. El Dorado County has, I believe the city of South Lake Tahoe has, but that doesn't, you don't really start seeing the benefits of that for 20, 25 years when they retire. So how are we going to get through this phase with the pension costs continuing to go up? For El Dorado County, for the next three years, they're projected to go up about five, five to six million dollars a year, each year for, for three years. We've already absorbed about 15 million dollars in increases over the last three years. So, so that's a significant, significant challenge. Second, hot topics and, and key challenges. And I want to try to focus this in Tahoe because that's, that's where we are. Um, but a lot of it is, is countywide. The, the landscape or the role of county government seems to have been changing a lot the past few years. We're, we're, we're having to deal with a lot more mandates from the state of California. Unlike the city that is, its, is an independent city, Counties are subdivisions of the state of California. So we are tasked with carrying out the policies of the state of California, whether we like those policies or not. That's our job to do it. So many times the state gives us mandates that we have to do, and most of the time those don't come with enough funding. They like to call it realignment. So the most, real, the most recent one was prison realignment in 2011. And that's when the state prison systems were too full and at capacity. I don't know if you remember that. So they said, we're not going to put them in state prisons. We're going to shift them to county jails. And they call it realignments because they're realigning it from the state to the county. And they, they say that's to give the counties more local control. Well, we all like local control. But if the state, my opinion, if the state had enough money to take care of the problem, they wouldn't be giving it to us. They're giving it to us because there's not enough money to take care of it. So we have prison realignment, we have public health realignment, we have mental health realignment, we have social services realignment, all these programs that come with some funding but not enough. And as the pension costs hit those programs, they're, they're outpacing the revenues coming from the state and the federal government. So that's one of the significant challenges. So what are some of the outcomes of prison realignment? Many will argue that was the, thing, that was the single issue that has caused the homeless spike. Because if you go back to the 80s, the, the mental health population was in institutions, right? And so the state of California and Reagan started closing those institutions. And where did the mental health population go? Anyone have a guess? The state prison system. So when you, because data shows 
70 to 80 percent of the prison population has some type of mental, mental illness. So they went to the prison system. Well, where did they go when the prison system was got too full and pushed it to the counties? Well, jails aren't meant to hold people for 15, 20 years. They were built and designed to hold people for a maximum of one year, and then they would go to the state prison system. So now they're in the jails, but the jails don't have the way to treat them, so they're, and jails are at capacity, so they now are in our community. And may, many would argue, and I would agree, you don't want to be treating the mental health in the individuals in the jails, but we've never developed the community-based programs to provide that service to them. So now you have the mental health community, or the mental health population in our community, but they can't afford, they can't function high enough to find a place to live, to have a job that's, that's contributed to the homeless problem. What else has con contributed to the homeless problem is housing. There's, there's a lack of housing in El Dorado County. South Lake Tahoe has done a very good job in trying to, and I think they have an affordable housing project coming online pretty, pretty soon. They've done a much better job of that than the county has alone. Now, the county participated in those discussions, but people always talk to, they say, why don't, they say, Don, we need to have a homeless shelter, and we probably do. But where do they go? The idea of a homeless shelter is for them to transition to long-term living, to affordable housing. Well, if we don't have affordable housing for them to transition to, how long are you going to keep them in the shelter? Most counties and cities in the state of California, they are trying to address the pension crisis, the pension costs, and the other costs for increased services two ways, that by growing or by and or by increasing taxes. El Dorado County isn't doing either. Um, in fact, quite frankly, after last Tuesday's election, no one's increasing taxes anymore, it appears. And none of us want to pay more taxes, but the money has to come from somewhere. Other jurisdictions are growing. El Dorado County is, is considered a no-growth county. We, don't, we want to be small and rural, at least on the west slope. One of my sayings is you can't be small and rural with low taxes, at least low in the state of California's perspective, which the county is the lowest. We're lower than the South Lake Tahoe as well. You can't be small and rural with low taxes and have high levels of service. Something's got to give. And if we're, got, if we're not going to grow at both our economic growth and our housing growth, we're going, and we're not going to pass taxes, we're going to have to start reducing services and shifting costs. And those are going to be some difficult, difficult decisions. Other challenges re uh, related to that is funding for our fire districts. Uh, we have a couple fire chiefs, fire chiefs here. There, as of Tuesday, there are now three, I believe, three fire districts that had ballot measures, in the pa ballot measures in the past two years, all of which failed for additional funding. El Dorado County, as a county government, isn't responsible for funding fire districts. By law, we're not responsible. Well, what's going to happen if we don't have fire districts? Well, that's obviously public safety. That's always everyone's number one priority. How are we going to fund these fire districts? It's going to be a big challenge across the whole county, including in including South Lake Tahoe. Talked a little about the homeless, the ha um, mental illness, pension liabilities. One of the biggest issues I think is going to impact South Lake Tahoe for the next 10 years and probably longer is right now we're going through the census, right? What happens after we complete the census at the end of this year? Most of next year is spent doing something we call redistricting. Anyone, everyone know what that means? A couple, couple people. What it, what it means is the county has to adjust the boundary lines of each supervisorial district so that there's an equal number of residents in all five of the districts. So if we have a population, it looks like it's going to be approaching 200,000. You know, that's 40, 45,000 dollars, 40 to 45,000 people per district. Well, how many residents live in South Lake Tahoe? Not 45,000. So what happens when you, draw, you redraw those boundary lines? They get pushed further down the hill. So up, if you go up to our, our neighbors to the north in North Lake Tahoe, the board member who represents Tahoe City and the north side of the lake also represents all the way down into Auburn. Okay, so what, what does that do to the representation for the Tahoe Basin? Well, it, it dilutes it, right? And I think you're going to start seeing the same trend on the south side because most of our growth is in El Dorado Hills. 
So you're going to see the boundary lines go further down the hill, which is going to make it harder for Tahoe to be represented by the County Board of Supervisors. So that's something you all need to be aware of and, and think about. There's nothing we can really do about it. But that's why what's, and I'll end with this, the best part where we are right now with El Dorado County, and it's with the city of South Lake Tahoe, it's with the city of Placerville, it's with our fire districts, it's with our school system, is the collaboration and partnership we're all demonstrating. Every night for the past week, for the past week at 430, we have a call with the cities, fire districts, education, school administra administrators, everyone talking about the coronavirus. The county's putting that on. We have to have that collaboration and those discussions. I, I was mad when Frank Rush left. I, I loved him. He, he brought so much of that collaboration to the, to the city of South Lake Tahoe. I believe the collaboration between the city and the county is, well, it's better than it's been in the 10 years I've been in El Dorado County. And it's, we're going to have to keep that because with that partnership and that collaboration, that will give the, you guys a voice in countywide initiatives as the as your as a, the boundaries of your your board members change all right so I'll stop there and I'm sure you'll have questions for me later okay next up we have Larry Walsh Larry Walsh is a member of the Douglas County Commission he's currently the vice chair it's interesting in Douglas County because county commissioners represent districts just like they do in El Dorado County, but the difference is that everybody in the county gets to vote for every commissioner. So, uh, so Larry, welcome. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I got this PowerPoint presentation about two hours ago, so bear with me. Um, uh, Commissioner Penzo, who's the chair, he was uh, to give this presentation, but I'm pitch hitting, uh, and I'm very, very happy and delighted to be here at beautiful Lake Tahoe. Um, I can tell you that the state of Douglas County is, is very good. We're healthy financially. Um, we've, uh, we've recently, in the last year and a half, have hired some extremely well-qualified professionals to run the county, and I want to tell you something, that was a big chore. Uh, we've hired a new county manager, a new assistant county manager, uh, a new C CFO, a community development director, a planning director, a public works director, and a county engineer. Those are significant positions in the county, and we're very, very happy that they're filled now, and, and uh, I'm sure they'll provide great leadership for the years to come. Um, the state of the county, uh, financially, we, uh, uh, through this robust economy for the last few years, uh, we've been able to sock away a lot of money into projects that have um, uh, been ignored for uh, years and some for decades. Uh, we've uh, we put a lot of money into our road infrastructure, uh, our facilities that uh, were aging, uh, stormwater control, which is very uh, prevalent in Doug uh, Douglas County. Uh, and, uh, and roads, uh, I mean, not roads, but uh, sewer and water. And especially here at the lake, it's very important that we have good water systems here at the lake. Uh, and so it's, it's nice to say that we've got a great county and it's, it's very strong, but we've got work to do and we have to plan for the future. The problem is um, uh, we don't know what this coronavirus is going to do. We don't know how it's going to affect the economy. So we have to start squirreling away money uh, pretty soon here we have budget uh, cycles coming up, so we'll see how that works. But uh, we do have uh, um, significant reserves. Um, last year, the, the state legislature actually reduced the um, maximum amount of reserves that we were allowed to have from 25% to 16% of our general fund budget. So uh, we would like to have it at 25, but the state runs us. Um, let's see. Some of the issues here at the state, by the way, I'm on the chamber board down in, 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 in the valley, um, a relatively new member down there. Um, we have a, a new change in leadership at, in, in the chamber down there too, Bill Chernock, for years, so at 13, 14 years he's been the, at the helm. He retired and we have Alicia Maine now, I think she'll do a wonderful job. 
we have um, the problem that the chamber has down in the, in the valley is there's a lot of people, older people, people with this color hair. Uh, and, and, you know, they don't use the services that the young population uses. And so the chamber uh, has its issues with some, a lot of no-growthers down in the valley, uh, and uh, it's hard to deal with, but uh, the chamber does a great job with the resources that they have. So, here we are. First of all, I want to tell you about Lake Tahoe. Um, 53 years ago, last month, my wife and I honeymooned here. And we had, uh, I think, about four or five feet of snow on the ground. So let's pray for snow. I hope this storm that's coming in is going to be great. Uh, but yes, we have a, a, our vision is to, uh, to create a community to match the scenery. And obviously, we have wonderful scenery in Douglas County from Lake Tahoe to Topaz Lake. Um, and, and creating a place, like it says here, where business employees and families can live. And that's, that's an issue. Like I said, we have an aging population. Uh, and we, we really need younger people to move into Douglas County. And we need to have a proactive government that's going to, uh, and there's affordable housing issues in Douglas County. I just got back from Washington, D.C. There's affordable housing issues all over the country. And so we need to really work on that. We can't stick our head in the sand. Um, you know, having a, a, a younger community uh, helps create a balanced economy. Uh, and, we, and we really need that. So we need, and we need to grow responsibly uh, all throughout Douglas County. Of course, we're limited here in, in the, uh, the Tahoe portion of Douglas County as to what we can build. But down in, uh, in the Carson Valley, um, we have plenty of room to grow. Uh, I'm not an advocate for uncontrolled growth, but we do have a growth ordinance down in Douglas County that uh, limits growth, and we're sticking to that actually below it. Um, believe it or not, in the last 10 years in Douglas County, the population has increased by 1,600. That's 1,600, excuse me, 160 people a year, which is not a lot of people. So we're growing slowly but surely. Um, as far as the lake is concerned, one of the um, uh, beautiful things that we're working on right now, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it, is the, the uh, Tahoe Event Center. Um, uh, that was created back, I believe, in the late 1990s by the um, uh, assembly, uh, the Nevada Assembly, uh, and they created the uh, Tahoe D uh, Douglas Visitors Authority to deal with um, a reduction. They saw a reduction of slowing down in, um, in tourism, even back then. And they also recognized that maybe gaming was slowing down as well. So uh, they created the Visitors Authority to bolster um, tourism, and they've done a great job. I think they've done a great job. Um, in 2016, the Douglas County uh, Board of Commissioners, and I didn't get on the board until 2017, but the Douglas County Board uh, created the redevelopment district up here at Lake Tahoe uh, in State Line. Uh, that's basically the casino corridor, uh, includes um, Edgewood, and it includes the uh, Tahoe Beach Club. And uh, their mission now is to build an event center, a year-round event center, that I think will contribute amazingly to um, uh, the economies of both South Lake Tahoe, El Dorado County, and Douglas County. So we're very much behind that. Um, they worked at it a lot. I know we have stakeholders uh, involved, uh, the, uh, the um, TARPA, T-A-R-P-A, and, and, and uh, uh, South Lake Tahoe, um, the Chamber. Uh, a lot of, uh, and, and of course, businesses up here are, are really, really behind the event such, which I think will um, just boom once it's built. Uh, uh, they're hoping to get it under, underway here in, um, uh, in May, I think, of this year. Um, there's still some approval, approvals to obtain, but uh, the county, the county board of, uh, super, uh, of commissioners uh, has 3-2 uh, behind it. We have a 3-2 vote, and we have endorsed the, the redevelopment agency and the event center, so uh, we're hopeful that'll be built. Uh, I'm sure you all know it's going to be on the corner of Lake Parkway and, and Highway 50 on the Mount Blue parking lot. But we're very, very excited about that. We're excited about the, um, yeah, get right up here. We're going to, this will, this will be right here. Um, the event center is right in here. Um, and I think, 
I think it's, and the, and the whole context of the uh, loop road uh, around the casino corridor trying to uh, uh, create a pedestrian atmosphere is going to really create a wonderful window uh, into South Lake Tahoe. Uh, uh, right? you, you folks have done a wonderful job on the South Lake Tahoe side in redevelopment. It's, it's, it's amazing. And uh, um, like I said, 53 years ago, we honeymooned up here, and it wasn't anything like it is today. So um, uh, I really think that this, um, uh, this plan, uh, it might take a few years to implement, maybe five years or 10 years, however long it takes. It's going to be very beneficial to the area. Um, the redevelopment agency would also, I'm hesitant to say this because there's a couple of fire folks out in the audience, but <clears throat> one of the things that's lacking up here is a um, fire station uh, in the casino corridor. And hopefully the redevelopment agency can help with that. Uh, I think it's a very important thing to have. Uh, Eric Smiley. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, the... the um, the event center itself is going to be financed uh, through um, uh, the state enacted uh, or gave the approval to have the casinos charge a $5 per night room charge uh, for, cust for uh, visitors to, to their properties. Uh, that will con uh, contribute significantly to the uh, cost of the event center. Um, the TDVA, the Tahoe Douglas Visitors Authority, they're the ones that are going to own and operate it. The county's not involved at all, although we are pledging about uh, a total of $35 million over 20, 25 years uh, to um, pay for the uh, uh, a portion of the bond that's going to be floated by the TDVA to uh, uh, build the event center. But it, it, it's something that really needs to be done because the cost of doing nothing is really significant to Douglas County. We have seen a decrease in our property tax revenue and sales tax revenue. Uh, from the lake portion of Douglas County. So the event center is very dear to our hearts, my hearts. Uh, when I ran for commission back in 2016, I was a proponent of that uh, uh, project, and I still am. Um, let's see, Main Street. Well, that's the history of the event center. I don't think we really need to go through that. Uh, um, I touched on it a little while ago. Um, Cost of doing nothing, the commission reaffirmed our support for the redevelopment agency. The Main Street Management Program, uh, this is significant. Uh, uh, again, it's, it's in collaboration with uh, uh, South Lake Tahoe. Um, and I, I think it's really going to be a beneficial um, uh, project. Uh, it really needs to be done. My, my, my wife and I were recently in Vail, and, and that's a beautiful um, pedestrian-friendly uh, uh, city, uh, and and this won't necessarily be totally pedestrian friendly, but it certainly will lead uh, to a much nicer, friendlier atmosphere than we have right now through the casino corridor. Um, let's see, Main Street Management Program. That looks great. I have to tell you again. Thank you very much. <laughs> it really looks great. And we're going to get there. Um, <clears throat> of course, the Main Street Management Program is a component of the US 50 South Shore Revitalization Project, including the Loop Road. Uh, uh, it's, it's, there's alternatives being discussed right now on, on exactly what to do, but I'm sure all the stakeholders will do a wonderful job in designing something we all can be proud of. Another project that we're working on in the redevelopment agency is the expanded Kale Drive vision plan. Um, Kale Drive right now is in a terrible state uh, and, and falling apart. Um, we have those beautiful meadows um, just to the north of uh, Kale Drive, and uh, we really need a nice entryway uh, into those projects down there. It's, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, it also, an, uh, an expanded Kale vision plan would include, I think, a roundabout not my idea, but somebody else said a roundabout um, at the corner of Kale and Highway 50. Uh, and even though Lake Parkway and, and, and uh, Highway 50 is basically the entrance to the state line, I think this here will add and, and be an enhancement to the whole experience in the, in the South Lake Tahoe area. 
and lastly, I think, uh, flap grants. Uh, I guess these are in progress right now. Uh, uh, an $11 million uh, grant for the uh, Tahoe South Gateway Recreation Project um, um, and a $40 million application for State Route 28 bike path and, and parking improvements. And I will say this, I was back in, um, in D.C. last week for a conference and, and I, I met with um, uh, one of our senators, Senator Cortez Masto, and uh, she told me that um, the 2016 Lake Tahoe Restoration Act, which was authorized some years ago, back four years ago, uh, they have put it in an ask for nine and a half million dollars, uh, and it was done with both South Lake Tahoe, or California, and Nevada. And that nine and a half million dollars will go to uh, water infrastructure plan uh, improvements here in the South Tahoe area. So I think that's significant. Uh, we have a big fire danger and we need to improve our water systems, especially on the Nevada side. So uh, I'm very happy about that. And I think that's about it. Uh, Kingsbury Trailhead. Oh, this is also very uh, important. It's, um, it was opened back in November last year. I was happy to participate in that. It's at the top of Kingsbury grade. Uh, it's got a great new um, parking lot, heated restrooms, uh, open 365 days a year. Uh, it averages 100 users a day. Boy, I, I, I can see that happening or going up to many more than that uh, as the years come. So um, I think I'll end with that. If you have any questions, obviously I'll be here. Thank, Thank you. you. So next up, we're going to hear from our regional agency, the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, and we're here uh, with uh, Joanne Marquetta, the executive director. I know she's had a busy day, as many of us had. I think she started in Sacramento and came back to the lake, and here she is with us this evening. Joanne Marchetta. Good evening, everybody. Um, the benefit of or burden of riding sweep is that you hear the same themes. So it is such a very interesting time uh, for Lake Tahoe TRPA turned 50 in December of last year. So this is our 50th anniversary year, and over this year, we are both looking back and looking forward. So tonight I'm going to do a little bit of both, both past and present. And I'm also going to talk here at the end about the state of human relations right now, because our effectiveness here in Tahoe as a partnership is wholly dependent on our capacity to cooperate, collaborate, find common ground, work together towards shared ends, and bridge what we know as the us and them divides. So TRPA's 50-year history has been one of making sure that humans can coexist with the lake and the land. And we have needed, if you, if you look back over history, we have needed a tectonic shift about once a decade. In the 70s, it was we stopped runaway development here. Some will remember there were plans for a four-lane freeway encircling the lake, a, bri a bridge across Emerald Bay, and a city right here of 750,000 people on the order of San Francisco. So in the 80s, we put in place growth control, and that was meaning putting upper limits on the amount of allowable commercial residential tourist development. In the 90s, we initiated what is today a multi-billion dollar shared restoration program called the Environmental Improvement Program. And since the 90s, we have leveraged nearly two and a half billion dollars in shared investment across all sectors, all the local governments, two states, regional government, federal government, and of course our private sector. In the 2000s, we enacted a ban on carbureted two-stroke engines. Does anybody remember that? It was to prevent literally tons of black sooty, sooty gook from entering our crystal blue clear waters here. And at the same time, we put in place scenic standards that assured that we could make development here compatible with our alpine landscape. Then in 2010, we, in that decade, we adopted a new regional plan 
and the focus there was on updating our uh, dated built environment, so redevelopment of our built environment became a priority. Why? Because we needed the environmental improvements that came with that redevelopment in order to make gains in other areas, stormwater, scenic, transportation, all kinds of, all kinds of other environmental areas where we needed gains. So that's just a sample of where we've been over 50 years. And as a result of those 50 years, trust me, I'm well aware um, some people like us, a few of you still hate us, but make no mistake, Tahoe would not be Tahoe uh, without us. So even with all that, all of with, with all of that, is it enough? It's not enough. Why? Climate change now is an absolute game changer here. It is both creating and exacerbating some new challenges for us that may be more intractable than even the last 50 years. And so what Tahoe looks like in 50 years is going to depend on how well we collaborate on today's new challenges, and it's going to require some new tectonic shifts because our scientists are now looking at the lake and the forests, and that changing climate is supplying a new set of challenges. The dynamics of the lake and forest are changing, our visitation patterns are changing because people are trying to escape heat. Our transportation and technology is changing, and our economy is changing. And in the face of all that systems change, which is where a regional agency works, we work in the big systems, what is foremost on our agenda? And I'm going to start with the lake. In the last 20 years, we've stemmed this very rapid decline in the lake's clarity thanks to the investment in the environmental improvement program that's reduced the amount of sediment that flows into the lake from stormwater. But now with new temperature records being set, air and water temperature is on the rise, we have more extreme weather events, and we're more at risk of harboring what are aquatic invasive species and the introduction of new species. Why? Because warmer waters create better conditions for those invasive species to take hold. So we're now having to look at added funding to our aquatic invasive species program in order to supply workforce needed to continue our mandatory boat inspection program here around the lake. And then another challenge with more precipitation is rain. We're seeing growing risks of actual flooding and we're needing to look at how do we handle excess water. So we're initiating work with our public utility districts, with South Tahoe Public Utility District, to begin to plan for how do we handle excess water in those heavy water years. These same climate effects are having a profound influence on what we know as our forests. So these prolonged periods of drought are creating stronger winds creating the conditions where a single spark from a careless campfire or cigarette or barbecue can ignite the next catastrophic fire. So many of us remember vividly Angora. I did. I do. As I fled my home. Many of us remember that. And we're working with our partners to actually secure more funding for our forest health treatment goals, and that will complete the work in the areas that are adjacent to our homes, which we call the wildland-urban interface, and we're going to complete that in five years. So in addition to that, we're beginning work at a new scale in our forests. We have untreated on the West Shore 60,000 acres, and we're working with our partners to complete that in well under a decade. So where the work we've already done, we were looking at small 100-acre projects. Now we're looking literally at thousands of acres at a time, dramatically scaling up our pace and scale. The forest landscape here at Tahoe, why? So it won't be reduced to a moonscape, and our homes will have a chance to withstand the next fire when it happens. OK, so now let me shift onto our built environment onto our developed environment and our communities. 
and TRPA is working with partners on a three-legged stool system of solutions, if you will. First, transportation and transit. Next, strengthening our communities and then how that integrates with our recreation visitor management. So those three systems work together. And with the short time I have, I'm going to note three areas where we're working on priority interests together. First is in transportation and specifically in transit. We're now serving millions of recreation visitors annually in every major mountain town across the West in a community like ours that's grounded in outdoor recreation, has a world-class transportation and transit system, and right now in places ours exists like a slice of Swiss cheese. Here's the good news. Solutions are now within our reach on this. To do anything about the gridlock and con congestion that we like to complain about, that plague our busiest tourist seasons, we are going to have to align around a seamless and coherent system of mobility here where more people will be able to choose to travel by means other than their personal automobile. And to get there, we may have to be willing to accept going at a different time, going in a different way, or perhaps even going to a different place. Those are the kinds of adaptations that may not be popular, I understand that, but in every tourism destination on the globe right now, they are putting those kinds of solutions in place to accommodate population increases and behavior change that prevent the impacts of overuse. So transportation is our top of the list priority right now at TRPA, and there are literally dozens of moving parts this year, we're updating the Regional Transportation Plan, and we're setting achievable targets for transit implementation. You have heard many of uh, my, my uh, colleagues here working to approve transformative projects. The Highway 50 Main Street Management Plan, coupled with the Event Center, will be absolutely transformative for the South Shore. And here's what's so important about those to project that they are crucial to the implementation of our regional transportation plan. They will help us to deliver the kinds of transit solutions that we're looking for. So in addition, we're assisting the newly formed South Shore Transit Management Association to build some stronger public-private partnerships on our South Shore Transit. And, and we're working on uh, some specific uh, congestion solutions along corridors that are very heavily used by our recreation visitors. So corridors like Camp Rich to Emerald Bay, where we've convened our recreation partners, the U.S. Forest Service, the state parks, and the Tahoe Transportation District. We're working on transit and parking solutions um, for those most congested times and places. We're also working with employers on the South Shore to incentivize the use of commuter transit. And importantly, we are working on some shared funding solutions for how do we deliver that world-class transit system here, where all of the local governments, users, states, the federal government, and the private sector are all contributing to funding that system. Right now, we have cabinet-level attention from both states, so the governor's administrations of both states are helping us to align around that regional transit vision and how to fund those increased transit services. Finally, there is this priority of the strength of our communities, and that means the priority of our housing supply for our workforce. The compact actually requires TRPA to harmonize the natural with the human-made environment, and that means considering our $5 billion tourism-based economy together with the strength of our local communities. So tourism fuels our economy here, and the economy falters when employees, I'm sorry, when employers can't find workers, and the workers 
are forced into longer commutes and they emit more greenhouse gases and they increase stress on our overburdened roadways. And TRPA is working to provide incentives for the construction of deed restricted affordable achievable housing units at prices that Tahoe's ordinary wage earners can begin to afford. We're going to be using this newly minted South Shore Housing Action Plan and TRPA will work with our partners to make sure that the mix of units is delivered in income brackets where we most need our workforce and our workforce, um, you know, those workforce units can be built. We're looking at ways to unlock actually the pool of second homes so that a percentage of those may be able to be converted to deed restricted permanent resident housing. There's a very innovative program in Vail called Vail Indeed that we could look at replicating that, that buys back homes and deed restricts those to uh, achievable housing for our workforce. So the idea I want to end with tonight is actually about the state of our current human relations. None of this, any of it that I've talked about or that my colleagues have talked about, transit, alleviating congestion, housing for workers, forest treatments, protecting the lake from new invasive species, flood protection, none of that will happen if we hold the mindset that those are someone else's problems. Progress on any of it is going, to, is going to require something of each of us and, in fact, all of us. And I was uh, reading a recent study. And so for people who study the human brain, here's what they know. There was a nationwide research study in 2010. And it said 94% of us, 94% of Americans, believe that we are usually and always polite and respectful and that we are making the world a better place, a kinder and better place. What if we're not? In another study, most of us regard the average person, and of course none of us are average, so the average person would be everyone else. The average person is distinctly unvirtuous. In other words, the overwhelming majority of us believe that we are not contributing to the world's problems. Problems right here at home where we live and work and that those problems are created by everyone else and so should be solved by everyone else. And here's the hard truth. We all play a part. The solutions start with you and with me and only collaboration, and I have staked 15 years of my reputation here in Tahoe on this, only collaboration and finding shared ground will pave the path to success and only collaboration will buck the tide of today's very broken human relations that we seem to be stuck in. So while solving the problems will only be possible with this tectonic shift that is a shift in mindset. What if we believed that we were literally connected to one another and that solutions depended upon finding common ground and agreeing to solve problems and go together, working collaboratively to sh achieve shared goals? And it might mean that some of us would see ourselves in the same boat with others who we believe are the source of the problem. And it means that we each have to sacrifice something of ourselves and our lifestyles and our expectations. And each of us might have to give up expecting others to adapt and actually begin to adapt ourselves. So if we want to go far here in Tahoe, we are going to have to go together in collaboration and not opposition. So I will end there and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks.
all of our panelists. Now is your time to interact, and we're going to take a couple minutes break. There are some uh, cards in the back, so you can write out your question. Right, Zach? Okay, front table and back by the water. So let's take a few minutes and come back with your questions, pass them to Zach, and we will ask our distinguished panel your questions. And we'll also take whatever the good folk on the live stream can send in on Facebook. So you all take a break, and we'll be back in a couple minutes.
passing them forward. Is Brandy ready to resume? Not sure. Okay. All right. All right. All right, we have a handful of questions here for our distinguished panel. Once again, thanks all for being here. Um, start off with a couple here, then there's a few more behind those. The, um, and this, I think, happened uh, quite a bit today. There was a concern, and this is for the mayor. There was concern in the business community, and probably broader than just the business community, that the city was going to declare a state of emergency relative to coronavirus or whatever, and there was a lot of concern about that. Can you share with us what's happening on that front? Yes, so we are not declaring a state Could you, of emergency. Maybe I think you should. The city's take on this, we do not have a health department at the city, so we are following our partners with the county who are aligning with the state and federal guidelines. We have all those resources on our website and are continuously updating those. So we are making sure that we are all doing the same thing, same messaging, same precautions, and, um, and there's a, a public I can pass this to, to Don because he uh, has been more involved in this throughout the day. So I'll actually let him elaborate on um, on what the county's position is. Because you and you have mentioned that you're having calls with all the districts and local governments, etc. Right. So today, the the county health officer and the sheriff both declared uh, the county health officer declared a public health emergency, and the sheriff declared a local emergency as a result of the coronavirus. What does that mean? It, doesn't, it's a way to get access to federal funding and additional resources to come in. We're getting overwhelmed with the number of phone calls, tracking people who may or may not have been exposed to coronavirus and following up with them and testing them and things like that. So this will allow us to shift uh, people's job assignments if we need to, get additional funding from the state and federal government. That's the primary purpose of it. The, the health officer is the one who has complete control in these types of situations. It's it's their authority, and in in every every county has a health officer. It's their authority to enforce restrictions and things. And, and as the mayor said, we're following the guidelines from the State Department of Public Health. Um, I emailed Steve today asking if we're still having this meeting because we're not compliant with the state guidelines right now, just so you're aware. Um, but there, a press release went out tonight uh, talking about the, the guidelines that were distributed. It, it was given to the city manager as well. And it, we're just, it's going to change our lives for a bit. That's just a reality and a fact we're going to have to live with. The economic impact, it's, we're already seeing it with the stock market. How is it going to impact long-term tourism and things like that? It's too early to tell. I, and one thing I will add, at this time, there are no confirmed cases in El Dorado County. But that's going to change. There, in all likelihood, there probably is someone that has coronavirus in our county. We just we just don't know it because now it's secondary and second, third, and fourth contacts. But there's no confirmed cases right now. While you're standing, Don, uh, there was a question for you, and thank you for that. Thank you both. Um, so uh, the state has stepped in a little on this fire insurance situation where people can't get fire insurance for their resident or, I guess, in some cases, their business. Uh, what is there any progress being made at the state level on that issue? Nothing real significant. The, the insurance commissioner has proposed some new legislation, um, but it, at the end of the day, in, in conversations we've had with him and conversations he, he's had in various community, community meetings and town halls, until the state of California figures out how to mitigate the fire risk, the insurance companies are, they have a business decision to make. Insurance companies are for-profit businesses, and if a town burns down, they need to have the money they don't want to go bankrupt, so they're, drop, they're not renewing insurance policies. So in order, the long-term solution here is that the state and really the federal government with all the federal forest lands are going to have to do a better job thinning our forests, 
clearing brush, clearing vegetation, so that we're not at as high a fire risk. Okay, very good. Thank you, sir. Um, so we talked about housing, Commissioner Walsh, and, and you mentioned housing as well. Um, the new housing action plan, which is really called the local resident housing action plan because it really deals with the needs of the local residents and workforce. Um, a lot of conversation about what's going on in the city, maybe to some extent El Dorado County. Can you envision something that Douglas County could contribute to the housing solutions? I know it's, it's a tough go with some of your colleagues. It, it's a very tough go. Um, uh, frankly, we have some elitists who live in Douglas County, and they think that everybody ought to live on a five-acre parcel with a million-dollar house, but yet they want the services that the community provides. Uh, we are a service-oriented uh, community. So it is tough. Um, uh, I know that uh, one of the counties, I think it was Story or Churchill County, actually, um, uh, the county actually purchased some land uh, to, um, to partner with the developer to build some affordable housing. And, and maybe that's something we could look at. Uh, we certainly need it. Uh, I want my grandkids to live up here, and, and uh, I'm sure most of you people want your kids and grandkids to live here. So uh, it's important, but we haven't got an actual plan yet, but we're, we're looking at it. We're not sticking our head in the sand. Thank you, sir. This one for, uh, for Joanne. Um, uh, I know that you referenced a big decision coming up soon uh, by the governing board on the events center. Can you give us any insight into uh, that triangulation? What, what is TRPA looking for? Indeed, this, uh, this month at our um, <clears throat> governing board meeting, we'll be, we'll be taking up the decision. And we have been uh, working uh, cooperatively, actually, behind the scenes to really um, try to align a set of interests around um, certainly the project delivers important economic transformation for the South Shore, but we are coupling that economic trans transformation with what I mentioned, which is important an important increment of implementation of our regional transportation plan and particularly on transit. So you can anticipate that visitors will come to enjoy the entertainment and events and um, conferences from the event center. And so we want to be sure that when they get here, they're able uh, to move around seamlessly and where we're beginning to develop that vision of the visitor parks once and then can move around our community on first-rate transit. So we're coupling that project with some important transit uh, improvements. Very good. One, one more for you while you're standing, Joanne. Um, and during your remarks, you spoke a lot about uh, partnerships. Uh, what specific steps is TRPA doing to build on those, and, and which do you think are really the most beneficial, or, or can you prioritize, I guess? I spend every moment of every day working on partnership. There is not a moment that goes by where we don't think about it, where we don't try to improve it, and where we don't think about new partners. So our relationships are everything. And I am known to say to my staff, relationship is absolutely everything to success. You may think it's the merits, but it is actually being able to sit at a table and um, find common ground and uh, solve problems together. So um, all the local jurisdictions now, we work closely. All the transportation agencies and transportation districts, there just, there just isn't a moment that goes by where that isn't our priority. And I know that that uh, that's a change from 50 years ago. <laughs> Very good. So uh, one for Don that came out of uh, the question or the statement you made about the, the census and the population uh, redistricting. Do you see in the next, you, you know the numbers of the county pretty well, do you see that after the next census that District 5 could include the city of Placerville? Or will it go down that far? That's a hard, that's a hard one to say. 
because the census because the census is still taking place. Um, it could it, the lines could also be drawn that it goes more into North County as well versus coming down the hill into Plasterville. So it's it's where you pick up the the population. The challenge with the North County is just there's, there's very few people living there. Right. But it, it it's going to come down. Uh, 50 further than it is now. I don't know that it'll make it all the way to Plasterville this this time around. Right. Okay. There was there was some good discussion about your comment there, and, and I'm very familiar with Plaster County and the fact that you know District 5 does include the county seat of Auburn. So, uh, Jason, Mayor, Mayor Collin, one for you here. Uh, the question is, how do we get a fire safe council in the basin as well as fire safe or fire wise communities? So that's a, I don't have the details for that, but I do know that in Al Tahoe, they have formed a Firewise community and they will be, I was talking um, to Diane Reese the other day and she's been spearheading that. So that will be, I think the, the first fire, I don't know if it's certified or uh, but Firewise community in town. And then hopefully that will help build some momentum for other communities around the city to become firewise because that is a, a big criteria that uh, especially looking at with insurance uh, that's one thing that you know the insurance commissioner had talked about was that we'll be looking at that I think part of it is confusion around terminology because there was the Nevada Fire Safe Council the Nevada Tall Fire Safe Council and that really represented communities all around the lake uh, through an unfortunate set of circumstances that organization went bankrupt and so later comes what we know today as fire adaptive communities which is again neighborhoods working together to become fire adaptive and there's a whole um, website and there are people working throughout neighborhoods to try to get people to come together to collectively reduce the fire danger in their community to improve their ability to get insurance and everything now there's a newer sort of higher standard yet which one neighborhood here on the south shore has achieved which is fire wise community so the most important thing, I think, is to work with your local government, your local fire district, and to learn from the people who know what you need to do on your property and in conjunction with all of your neighbors. Because you might have the most defensible space home in your neighborhood, but if you're the only one, it's, it's, uh, it's not really going to work as effectively as you wish. So neighborhood collaboration, whatever you call it, fire adaptive communities, fire safe council, fire wise communities, uh, there's a lot of good information on the website. And uh, people like Chief Baker here and Fire Marshal Gabon from Tahoe Douglas or from the city or from El Dorado County, Lake Valley Fire, they can really help you understand. And then to get together with your neighbors and create uh, a community wide appro approach. So. And, and at the, the ins insurance commissioner's meeting, which it, it was down at Cameron Park, I think in November or so when we were down there, one of the things they did talk about, at least in California, was that fire wise distinction is very important because there were a lot of the other. Um, programs going on so I appreciate you making that distinction as well a lot of terminology yeah. all right um, another one for uh, Commissioner Walsh uh, this comes uh, from a person um, in the younger demographic in Douglas County uh, you said and I I understood what you said uh, that the county needs to attract more young people but as a business owner with a family I feel the county is doing everything they can to make me want to leave how can how can you help change that? That's a, that's a tough question. Um, it's it's just a matter of educating. I think the the uh, aging population um, they they need. I mean, for instance, they're they're screaming for better health facilities. Okay, nobody's going to build better health facilities if the population doesn't grow, and, and unless the hospitals have uh, workers uh, to work there. So it's it's a um, um, complicated issue. Uh, frankly, we have a, uh, uh, a development ordinance in Douglas County that allows us to grow uh, uh, to a certain degree every year. It's 2% compounded. Uh, and frankly, we haven't reached that. So, um, you know, projects like, like the event center, that, that's going to bring um, young families, I believe, to, to, uh, to Douglas County uh, and to South Lake uh, to uh, uh, to work there there's there's just um, uh, you know it's, it's tough for me to say I I don't know we don't have a plan to actually attract young generation uh, my daughter lives there my grandkids live there uh, 
Uh, but we don't have a plan to say, we don't, we don't want to a sign that says, uh, welcome young people to Douglas County. Uh, uh, I'm from New York and, and uh, I, I laugh every time I see this, there's a sign as you leave Brooklyn that says, forget about it. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, you, we, don't want, we don't want people to forget about Douglas County. We want people and we welcome them uh, with open arms to, uh, to come and join us. Well, I, I know that you do, and I know that many others in the county do understand the importance of the coming generation and having young people feel like they're one, welcomed and wanted in the community. I know that not all of folks in the, have that same feeling. So We do have a challenge. We have a contingent down there that's, that's challenging to deal with. I know from a chamber perspective, every time we, or virtually every time we testify before the county commission on some issue, we're always bringing that issue up. What, what are you doing to make the young people in your county uh, feel welcome and to encourage others. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really, it's a key question. It's one of those ones that you just have to keep, keep working away on. Um, some of the folks there, they, this is their retirement community, and even though it isn't a gated community per se, that's the way they treat it. And I, I use the example of, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area. Somebody, a lot of somebodies, had the great idea to build bridges from one side of the Bay Area to the other. And a lot of people who built those bridges didn't even get to see, live to see them function. But they knew it was the important thing to do for the future generation. And God love them for that. That's the kind of thinking we need about what legacy are we leaving to the folks who come after us, some of whom are you. Um, so um, the, um, some, some of the folks in the audience wanted to have a little bit more clarity on how the county works with the local governments uh, a lot of concern, you know, we, we've had, we're coming off of, uh, even if we get some snow next week, great. But it's been a tough year for business. And now we have the coronavirus. And yes, we all want to do the right thing and we all want to be healthy and we have a healthy community for ourselves and for our visitors. But there seems to be a lot of alarm. And I know some of the businesses here, it's not just here, it's other places, and are operating on pretty thin margins. So could you help us under, understand a little bit more about the relationship between what you're hearing from the state, what you're passing along through county health officers, and what's going on down to the city level? Maybe, Don, you're the best to try to bring some clarity around that. That's a hard one, because I think it's a little too soon to really know what, what's going to happen. But if you listen to the president's address last night, he talked about a certain billion number of billions of dollars for small business loans to try to give to small businesses to, to, to survive uh, a, down, a downturn for a while. No, no discussion or indication of how that money is to come to, to local governments and how it's going to get here and how it's going to be used. So, so we don't know. Um, that's, what's, that's the scariest part about this whole thing is it, it's, there's a lot of unanswered questions. You know, when I, know what, when I woke up this morning and found out the NBA had can't postpone the rest of its season and March Madness is done, that's like, what is really going on, you know, for it to be that, that big? Um, so a lot of unanswered questions. The, the governor's executive order it, that was issued today um, is, is scary as well because it, you know, and I'll use this as an example. County governments and city governments and public bodies have to follow what's called the Brown Act, the public meeting laws. The state of California loves putting laws on local governments they have to follow. Well, today the government issued an executive order basically relaxing all those laws to allow business to get done. For the state of California to make changes like that, they're taking it very seriously. Um, but it's too soon to tell how it's going to play out. Well, I, I, I suspect that all of you at the local level, uh, I hope that all of you at the local level have, you know, some uh, empathy for people who are trying to stay in business and, and keep their employees employed. And that's why I think there was a lot of concern about the city. And obviously, you don't have that authority. But if the city said there's a state of emergency, that's an immediate reaction. The visitors are already saying, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to go there. Um, I'm not feeling welcome, I'm feeling endangered, and that immediately puts at risk a lot of the businesses in our community. So. Right, so we, we are definitely, we, are, we do not want to elicit any more fear than is already out there, and just encouraging everybody to follow the guidelines. I mean, in the CDPH guidelines, it says use common sense. So keep distance, good hand washing, good hygiene techniques, 
Uh, and so that's really the, the main guideline. And then um, not hosting events or going to events with more than 250 people. Uh, we had discussions today with the city leadership about making sure that our public safety uh, and first responders are how, how they stay safe and how they stay in the field so they can support the community. Uh, we're also discussing how even at the city level, how to keep things going in the city. Is remote work an option? Do we have the ability to do that from an, an HR and a California labor law side of thing? There's issues that come up with that when you're not set up for it. So we, we are discussing it, uh, but really it's still following the guidelines. We will be talking about um, what happens when because right now there are recommendations, but if if it comes down from the state level that they say you have to ban events of a certain size, like how do we manage that? Uh, at this point, they're not doing that, but some counties, Washoe County, just put a ban on events uh, through the end of April of, with over 250 people. So we're not there yet, but we are, we're gonna be talking about this every single day and trying to stay in front of it and trying to mitigate as much impact that this virus will have for the health of our community. I mean, the health, the physical health, and the economic health of our community. Don, you, is there any conversation with our state legislative re representatives? I know that they tend to be in the minority party, but any conversations with them to try to, you know, I think the state has been putting out things like twice a day at least. It seems, seems like it's kind of gyrating a little out of control. Is there any opportunity to call up our state senator or state assembly member and say, hey, could you be down there as a voice of a little bit more reason? I don't know if that's possible. It, we could try. Um, we, we haven't yet. I will tell you simply because staff at, all, staff at the county level are just inundated with phone calls and from the community. It is changing so fast. Right. Um, our health officer is on calls every day with uh, communicable, communicable disease control from the federal government, from California Department of Public Health. The county health officers are talking every day. And every time you try to pull her away from those, she's not getting information. So that, that hasn't happened yet. Understood. So th this is an open question to anybody that uh, wants to uh, stand up and, and give an answer, and it could be more than one. But the question was, can the alert Tahoe system be leveraged in some way to kind of help with the fire insurance costs. The, the alert Tahoe system is the system of cameras around the basin that looks at the forest and spots smoke or spots flames and hopefully directs the first responders to that to location fairly immediately. I'm not sure that, that that can be used in that way, but probably, probably not. We don't, or we don't know. Mr. Insurance Expert. I was going to ask Mr. Anderson here in the front row. Don answered the question that the profit issue. Right. I don't reckon. Right. Since that board, I guess we have to look at Tahoe separately. Because we have made a lot of progress. Got it. It's hard to talk from the audience just because we don't pick you up on the microphone, but I understand what you're saying. Is part of it is the ISO rating, which not the ISO, the brush line. Okay, the scoring system. So, Joanne, the TRPA, you have a local government committee, which is now your local government and housing committee, which are dealing with a number of issues, including partnerships on the housing issue. Is there anything that that committee or TRPA can do to help on the uh, homeless issue? You know, one of the one of the things that uh, is important for TRPA to uh, always evaluate is what is an appropriate regional issue, and what is an issue better handled at <clears throat> another level of government. And honestly, the homeless issue is an issue of of social structure. So. We will work on systems for supplying affordable and achievable housing, but it's, it's just simply not in TRPA's bailiwick right. within the compact to be dealing with social service and health issues. It, it's appropriate at a different level of government. Right. 
Understood. So I do know that within the city anyway, Mayor, uh, that the Clean Tahoe program has been, the, their scope has changed a little bit where they do now go in and clean up homeless campsites and work with law enforcement and fire on making sure that those are not in and of themselves a health hazard, right? Yes, they are. In fact, I was just talking with, with Katie Sheehan, the executive director from Clean Tahoe the other day about that because it, it is still a big problem. And um, so looking at what other resources they may need, whether it's additional staffing or support from the city with CSOs or police uh, to mitigate some of the homeless camps because of um, especially the, just the trash that they're leaving out and then safety concerns as well around them. So and it, fire. It, I mean, fire, yeah. We've, we've had a number of fires that have been started uh, in Atlanta last year. So it's something that is definitely, the conversation is, is being had. Uh, I don't know that we have a solution yet or we haven't made any additional commitments, but we are engaged in that conversation for sure. And while you're standing, um, so you made mention during your comments, uh, Mr. Mayor, that the, the council was now more engaged in the Highway 50 project and the, what specifically uh, were you referencing there? What uh, well, Councilmember Bass is here now too, so I saw that. Uh, and it, just for the record, too, that I recuse myself from these conversations because I own real property uh, in the area. So, uh, and maybe I'll even have Councilmember Bass since he showed up. Do you want to come up and, and talk to speak to that since you are on the Main Street Management Plan and as well? Good timing. Good evening, Councilmember Bass. Nice to see you. Thanks for stepping up. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I would say that, you know, from the council that uh, took seat a little over a year ago, uh, we really have decided to become engaged in the conversation around uh, the Highway 50 revitalization, and our previous city manager, Frank Rush, uh, did propose a, a little bit of an alternative that could possibly really work, and we started to, to gain definitely support at the council level, um, and we, we are definitely um, engaged in the public um, kind of workshops to really get the public buy-in. Um, again, I think there's no doubt that this project can be uh, a real benefit to the city, but we have, uh, we have to get involved and we have to get in front of it and we have to become a part of it uh, to really get the best of what it is. And I think for a long time, because of it being a divisive project, uh, the previous councils really didn't want to uh, kind of put their name on it and they, they kind of stepped away from it. Um, we're really not looking to do that. And um, I think there's really, as we've kind of come together to talk about it, we've even come to like better and cooler ideas and things that can really, um, I think, improve the project in so many ways. So that's really what it's about. And as we continue to go, um, I think we've all made a commitment on the council to stay engaged in the dialogue um, and really try to get our community uh, proud of the project, engaged in it. That's really what redevelopment and what this is about is like, let's get everybody here at the table involved um, and, and really try to get this to become a reality. So that's what it is. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. And just to, to build off of that and off Ms. Marquetta's comments earlier, what, what the big change was this, this spirit of collaboration and, and connecting. And as Councilmember Bass said, the city kind of took a hands-off approach for a long time, and it's really, it's been great to, to, to bring the city into it. And it, and it really has made a, a huge difference. And it's, it's changing the hearts and minds of a lot of people. And it's really, it's going to be a, a better project for it. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Does anybody on the panel have a final comment, something you didn't say, something you want to end with uh, as we close out this particular program? I think it's been very valuable for all of us. I hope it's been valuable for each of you. And I hope it isn't the last time we do something like, like this. But anything else, Joanne? And no, I just want to say I always enjoy an opportunity to speak with the community. So thank you for being here, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Walsh? No, not really. I don't have a final comment. I'm just happy to be here. I was, I'm, I'm glad I pinched it for Barry, get an opportunity to meet my fellow uh, uh, local, officials. local officials. It's great. Uh, so yes, I, I, I'm happy. Uh, I think we're moving forward. Uh, I'm glad to hear the comments about the revitalization plan. Um, so, uh, and I'm looking forward to an event center that someday will, will get built, someday soon, I hope. Thank you. Very good. Don? Yeah, thank you for having me. I, counties and cities I have very difficult decisions coming in the future. And the only way that best decisions will be, will be made is if there's commu community involvement. 
from you. It, it makes it messy. It makes my job hard. It makes their jobs hard. But that's how our, that's how our system is supposed to work. And if you're not engaged, nothing good is going to happen. So stay engaged. Force your elected officials, force your city manager, force me to make sure we continue that collaboration. Because without that, it will just crumble on ourselves. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, I appreciate everybody that came out tonight and everybody that's live streaming. Hopefully next time when we do this, we'll be able to have a packed room because I know there's a 250 lot of people. Yes. Right. <laughs> so I know there's a lot of people who were planning on coming that hopefully are watching. And, uh, and I love that Joy had talked about the spirit of collaboration because that's really making the difference in our this community. In the last year, the relationships between the city and, of South Lake Tahoe and El Dorado County have, have improved tenfold at least. I mean, it's, it's amazing. The 56 acre project, what we're gonna do there is going to transform our, it, it's the city and the county because it's a shared, uh, shared area. And then the event center with the Highway 50 re revitalization program with Douglas County, with TRPA, we're getting things done. We're building a ton of momentum. So we just have to keep that right now. We have this issue in front of us with the coronavirus, which is scary. And we are going to lose momentum but we won't lose it all. So we've built a lot. We're going to keep, we will keep some. We have to stick together as a community. The biggest thing I would ask and encourage people to do is don't elevate the fear beyond where it needs to be. Pay attention to the facts. Look at the resources that we are providing. So we are aligned with the county. The county is aligned with the state. The state's aligned with the CDC. So pay attention to what's going on and, uh, and then follow that. Be smart. Use good judgment, common sense. And, uh, and we will get through this and we will bounce back. Let's have a hand for our panel. Thank you all very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being on the live stream. Thanks Brandy Brown and the Tile Production House team for being here. Thank my chamber teammates and our board members. And we'll see you in another event soon.